the grand picture that we're looking at here is the human settlement of space. But nobody stays until somebody pays. That can be taxpayers and probably will be in terms of an investment in the early phases of what we're doing. Um, or it can be extremely wealthy individuals. Uh, but in the end, it has to be an economy. There has to be the development of an industrial economy. Uh, an economy that has harnessed the resources of the place you're in, or you can't stay. Otherwise, you're just a visitor. Um, the concept behind deep space industries is as grand as you can get. It's about expansion of human civilization beyond the Earth. But we have to know how to live off of the land in space to do that. We can't bring everything with us on our backs. And we certainly want to be as independent as possible, as quickly as possible. I can talk this talk all day long, but I gotta be able to walk the walk. And Deep Space Industries is us walking the walk. We, you know, nobody can come up to me and say, well, you know, you're, you're just some abstract guy up there preaching and yelling at everybody. No, I got my hands dirty, I'm in there. You know, I have to come up with budgets, I have to deal with staff, I have to deal with fundraising. Um, we have to deal with all the aspects of, of creating a business. So um, it, it's really about getting in there and getting it done. You know, many years ago, when I first got into this field, I had a, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. Many years ago, when I first got into this field, um, I was up there proselytizing about the cause. And uh, there was a NASA engineer who uh, raised his hand uh, and, and said, you know, the further away you are from the problem, the easier it gets. So for you to get up there and preach about it, that's great. You don't know what's going on. So I got involved. And um, you know, we did LunaCorp, which was one of the first attempts to do commercial lunar activities. We ended up shooting the world's first commercial on the space station. Um, I did MirCorp, uh, where we took over the Russian space station and um, tried to commercialize it. By the way, the core goal of MirCorp originally was asteroid mining. Very few people know that, except the founders of the company. The goal of the takeover of the Mir was to use it as a construction shack to build Mir 2 and to do on-orbit assembly of satellites um, and then to get into satellite repair. And once we were into satellite repair and reboosting to move ourselves out and deeper into space and do asteroid mining. When we announced Finds the Foundation for the International Non-Government Development of Space, which was a $25 million endowment, the goal of which was to fund activities leading towards space settlement. So when we created the Foundation for the International Non-Government Development of Space, my job was to give away the interest from that. It was the most wonderful job one could ever have in the space field. My job description was literally give funds to space projects that move us along the critical path to human space development. It was awesome. And um, we funded asteroid mining research. Uh, John Lewis, uh, who wrote the book Mining the Sky, Rain of Iron and Ice, Mark Saunter, uh, we funded them to a tune of, I think, of a half a million dollars. Um, gave $100,000 to Bob Zubrin to form an organization called the Mars Society. I'm not sure if that was a mistake or not, but the idea was to create an organization that would put pressure on NASA to get out of orbit and go towards Mars. Uh, we were looking at uh, beamed power. Uh, we were looking at robotics, solar sails. Um, we were looking at uh, closed life support systems and helping fund all kinds of activities in all of those areas. The idea being that downstream that would all come together in terms of being able to put together the uh, puzzle pieces of an in-situ resource utilization based economy in space. Um, and that was in the 1990s. So I've been involved in this quite a while. Um, it all goes back to Jerry O'Neill. He really is the godfather of soul of this movement. And um, whether it's planetary resources or deep space, excuse me, whether it's planetary resources or deep space industries, um, we all go back to Gerard K. O'Neill and the High Frontier. We all come from that route. Um, and Freeman Dyson and Dr. John Lewis. Um, these are the guys who uh, really um, inspired us, gave us permission to dream, and uh, 
put us on the path to going out and making it happen. You know, they say that uh, one company is an anomaly, uh, two companies is an industry. So we have at least two uh, space resource-based companies now. Um, by being in this field, we help create the field. See, by creating deep space industries, um, we help those people who are planning downstream long-term development, resource exploration, or just uh, you know, NASA science exploration missions, things like that, to be able to put into their calculations the idea that there might be somebody downstream who can supply them in space. The fact that they're putting that into their planning helps legitimize our activities today. So it's a cycle in a circle. They, they feed on each other. If they know we're going to be there, they can plan for us to be there. We can point at the fact that they're planning for us to be there to take to investors to help create us so that we can be there to supply them when they get there. And it all begins to work together. And we begin to move to what I call um, an industrial economy. Now that, uh, since a lot of those projects that you worked on in the past is, may not have come together the way that you had hoped, um, a lot of those plans and ambitions obviously are seeming to go forward with deep space industries. And with that being said, uh, what sort of critical path do you have for, let's say, the next 20 years to be able to, to get to the point where we are able to start building things in space and, and fulfill the dream? Deep space industries is the kind of organization that is designed to survive over the long term. We are going to be looking at different sorts of products, different sorts of projects that you're going to be hearing about in the next year or two that may be a little surprising, that may be not directly, you would think at first glance, to be in line with the idea of mining asteroids. But it all will tie together in the long run. See, I have to be able to pay for a team um, we have to be able to um, invest in the development of technologies. We have to be able to uh, plan for what's going to happen years down the road. Um, and yet we have to be credible now. We have to be able to show our investors an increase in the value of their investments. Um, and we have to show at some point, at least downstream, profitability. When we are talking about harvesting space resources. The closest analogy here on Earth is mining. Mining is something that requires a long-term mindset. You have to be able to think in terms of 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But we also be, have to be able to look at how do we return or allow investors to get in and get out at different periods of time during that that longer scope. Um, so we're looking at a lot of different projects that can be um, wrapped up and completed. Be it fireflies, we believe that we can put fireflies um, and do the first commercial asteroid flybys within two years of full funding. That's $20 million. Um, that gets you three fireflies. And by the way, if you're buying uh, or sponsoring or involved in that project, you're not buying the vehicle, you're not buying the spacecraft, you're buying the success of the mission. Now that may sound like a subtle difference, but what that means is, based on the deep space industry's philosophy, we will build three spacecraft to make sure that at least one of them succeeds. Um, and they will be built in a sort of parallel sequential manner um, according to our plans so that as we learn from that first spacecraft out of the production line and onto the rocket that we're you know, buying a ride from, uh, we can apply that to the second one. And what we learn in the second one, we can apply to the third. If the first one succeeds, mission accomplished. Now we can repurpose vehicles two and three to something new. Same thing with the Dragonfly sample returns. Um, everything is going to be built in threes. That reduces risk significantly um, without having to get into this over-engineering, super high-cost approach that you've seen in traditional aerospace. 